And what was your branch of service? Army. And your highest rank? Corporal. Okay. In what general locations did you serve? Uh, as a reservist, I was assigned uh, to an anti aircraft unit in uh, New York City. When I went on active duty, I was sent to Camp Atterbury, Indiana. Okay, we couldn't hear. I couldn't hear you when you were talking about as a reservist. What unit? What is it in New York City? Um, I don't remember the unit. It was an anti-aircraft. Okay. Battery. Okay. Thank you. Um, were you drafted or did you enlist? I enlisted. And where were you living at the time? In Hartford, Connecticut. In Hartford. Okay. Do you recall the date? that I enlisted yes. was in February 1951. Okay. And why did you join? Um, because then I had the choice of uh, where I would serve and uh, I would not be drafted. And also I was sales manager at the time for a tobacco company in Hartford and uh, I, I handled all the insurance for the company and the agent was my commanding general oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh in gosh. New York. <laughs> oh, okay. Um. So does that have something to do with this the service branch that you chose also? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, the Army. Um, do you remember your first days in service at boot camp or um, when you first signed up? No, not really. I remember that every other Wednesday I had to go to New York uh, for service and two weeks. Um, during the summer, we went for training, usually at Camp Edwards in Massachusetts. Okay. Um, do you remember anything else about your experiences? Was it mostly classes, or did you do the traditional boot camp also? Um, I didn't do the traditional boot camp until I got to uh, Camp Atterbury, Indiana, okay. when I was on active duty. Okay. Do you remember any of those experiences? It was very hard. It was very hard. Because every morning uh, I woke up with terrible headaches and um, I would have to go uh, to sick call every morning and they would give me a shout of Novocaine oh, wow. in my temple to relieve the headaches. And that's how I got through the day. Um, I graduated from boot camp after eight weeks of boot camp, uh, going through in this way. Um, and then one night, uh, they found me marching uh, down a four-lane highway. And uh, counting cadence, thinking I was going to the firing range. And they brought me back and uh, put me under hypnosis and found out that I had a phobia against wearing a uniform oh. because of what I went through during the Second World War. And I'd seen all the cruelty of the Nazis and it absolutely prevented me from wearing a uniform and that's why I had those headaches. That's why you had the headaches too. Yeah.
in the so, situation. So, uh, right then they decided that the, I should not wear a regular uniform. And fortunately for me, the psychiatrist that uh, worked on me was a Captain Pierce. And he decided that he could use me in the hospital and I could wear uh, doctor's lights and prevent me from ever having to wear the uniform again. Wow. So did you did you graduate from boot camp or did they did they Yes, say I you graduated didn't? from boot camp. Okay. And did you receive any um, insignias or anything? No. No. That yeah, was part of not accepting just sharpshooter. Okay. We got that. That was it. And that that must have been difficult too when you had to go under the firing range and, oh, and yes. go through all of that. Wow, yeah. because of the memories. Wow. Um so after boot camp you went to the hospital at the right. recommendation of Dr. Pierce. Mm -hmm. Okay. And um what were your first impressions when you arrived there? Did you did he tell you about your assignment and did you meet any of the people you were working with? Um, he was the only one that actually worked with the patients. Um, we had six uh, locked wards, um, 14 A and B, 15 A and B. 16 A and B. Um, each person was locked in a separate room, a small cell actually, and then there was a large common room in each unit. So you could work either with individual patients or at the most with eight patients at a time. I had to learn what to do with these patients. Um, basically, with shell shocks, uh, what happens is the mind protects itself because it uh, cannot fathom what they're involved with. Most of these uh, fellows were uh, good hunters. Okay. They had lived by uh, shooting at game and uh, hunting deer, rabbits, you name it. Uh, they were not used to having what they were shooting at, shoot back at them. They couldn't understand that this yellow fellow was a friend and the fellow that looked just like him was the foe. And it just became too much. And the uh, mind just shoves down a shell over and they become vegetables. So most of them, when they came in, we didn't even have their records. They went to Washington first. So all we had was a person on a stretcher that would come in and we would bathe them and then put them in their cell and leave them there, um, feed them, um, and hope to soon have some records so that we could start working with them. Days were long. I started every morning at seven o'clock and um, Usually, I was through by about nine o'clock at night. 
then I would go uh, upstairs to the Red Cross and we would coordinate uh, how we were handling the families back home. Um, most of the families that we worked with uh, really did fathom that these boys would come back. As far as they were concerned, he was nuts, so therefore he was dead. And so every night you had to either speed up or slow down the process at home because if they were ready to accept him, well, we couldn't really release him yet. Okay. They would say, I told you he was nuts and you'd lose it again. Um, and you could not have the person ready and the family not ready to accept him. So it was a juggling I usually had about 40 active patients I was working with. 40? Yeah. And then uh, it was the juggling with the Red Cross always. So I was through usually around 10 o'clock at night. That was a long day. Okay. And uh, the good thing was that we had two nurses from Tennessee who had in one corner of the uh, lab still. So I brought my orange juice and had a little drink before going <laughs> to bed. <laughs> it sounds like you needed it to relax. Yes. And I did this seven days a week except for Sundays when I took two hours off to go to church. I was a unusual uh, corporal because of the doctor's status. Um, Captain Pierce got me uh, a membership in the officers club so that if I missed meals because I was busy with patients, mm -hmm. I could always get a meal at the officer's club. So that was unusual. <laughs> <laughs> um, I had a very good experience there. Um, it was very interesting. You would work with a group of patients and you'd read these little golden books, you know, from the kids. Oh, yes. And you would look to see if you could get a flicker of recognition in somebody's eyes. Mm -hmm. um, I had one about fishing and one guy, I could see the flicker. So, Later on, I had him by himself, and I started telling him about my uh, weekend of deep sea fishing, where I had been casting for trout. And he looked at me, he said, you don't cast for trout in deep sea, you cast in a brook. <laughs> I had him, yeah. you know. It was that kind of recognition mm -hmm. that you could get just by sitting reading golden books. And you would start making progress and you would see the mind developing and being comfortable again. Mm -hmm. And comfortable enough that they would start talking. Uh, the worst were the rainy days. Rainy days are depressing, yes. and um, 
usually ended up that they got violent. So, um, if somebody pointed at you and said, he's the guy that got us into this, um, then they would attack you. And I had several buttons around the place that I could push. And then a lot of, uh, a bunch of orderlies would come in. They would pull me out of there. I think the worst day was the day that I got um, to change uniforms six times. Wow. But you had to go back in. You couldn't let them get the upper hand. Right. So you just kept going back and hoped they had calmed down. Um, I did some things that um, I am sure are not recorded. Um, you know, these were marked boards yes. and they weren't allowed anywhere else in the hospital, of course. Mm -hmm. Well, I had a whole bunch of guys that were all from Boris country. And I talked my friends at the Red Cross into getting uh, two buses. And I had a bunch of orderlies. And we went and took them to a rodeo oh. about 40 miles from camp. Oh. Uh, I lost half of them and found them all with the horses, oh. standing there currying the horses, braiding manes. It was fantastic. I had 40 of them that I actually could discharge within six weeks. It was terrific. Wonderful. But not the most favorite thing for me to do, uh, according to our commanding general of the hospital. <laughs> but you did, you saw a need for them and it yeah. worked. Yeah. And another time we got a fellow in and while he was in the bathtub, he was singing. He had the most beautiful voice and it was obviously a trained voice. He didn't even have his name or papers or anything, but I knew the general was going to have some guests, so I figured he was away. So we had a USO show that night. Oh. So I talked the band leader into letting him sing with the band. He just blossomed. Yeah. We had him out of there within two weeks. It was just... You found something. Yeah. And, um, of course, the thing that didn't help was that in the first row, in the audience, was the general with his two friends. Uh, I offered to put my stripes on zippers so he could get them off for a piece here. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and he'd tell me to get out of there. <laughs> but they, once they saw that the gentleman was singing, the patient, the, the yeah. that he was singing, I hope he felt better about that and what yes. he did for him. Yeah. And his friends. <laughs> well, he just kept telling me that I broke so many rules, but it was working. <laughs> yes. What a way to break them. Yeah. 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 And that was all I was interested in. And it seems that you didn't have any formal training. As you said, None. you pretty much learned as you went along. Yeah. And you had, but you, I think you had that built-in compassion yeah. and caring for them. No. And a challenge. It was important. Yeah. 
en dat is nodig. Ik ben voor de help, en dat voor de man te zitten. When you went to them, were they in a group then? You could take them out of those rooms, or was were the, the groups the ones of that were six or eight? Was six, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Could yeah. You, the ones that were locked in, as you say, a cell, could they ever come out and be a part of the group, or did you have to only to you would switch them. with them? You okay. Know, eight would go back, and eight would come out. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Just work. With what you could. Mm-hmm. Did they? What did they? Did you ever get to a point where they remembered their service, and that must have been challenging. Yes, mm-hmm. that was part of it. They had to remember that. Yes. Uh, because they had to go on with a normal life afterwards. Right. The hardest part was that you know, you could never. Recognize them on the street if you met them afterwards. Oh, really? Because that would be traumatic for them. It would. It would. Yeah. Okay. Because it would remind them of the times when they were locked up. Um, I've had wedding invitations oh. of people that I couldn't answer. Yeah. I've seen some of the patients in Hartford and quickly uh, go on the other side of the street so they wouldn't uh-huh. see me. In a way yeah. that's very sad because in a way you would think it would be a wonderful connection for them. It, you didn't them. want to bring back the memories of the, that okay. particular time. That but did you, so did you have to work with families once they went back home? To make sure that they didn't trigger anything either. Uh, no, uh, that was up to the Red Cross. Oh, okay. I, okay. That's why I had to coordinate with them. I see. I see. And that was how I finally cracked. Yeah. Um, I had a patient. He was twenty-one years old. He was absolutely brilliant. He was a full professor of English at the University of Chicago. And um, he was a mama's boy. And uh, I finally got him ready to the point where he could go home for a weekend, that was always the first step, Mm -hmm. just let him go for a weekend. It happened that on the same block in Chicago, there were two mothers of the same name, both with sons in the army. And the Red Cross had prepared her own mother. Oh. And he came home, found his mother dying of cancer, took a gun and put her out of her misery. And with that, he automatically, under the law, was committed to an institute for the criminally insane for the rest of his life. For the rest of his life? And that did me in. I understand that. Oh my gosh. Did you, how did you hear about it? Did he, was there someone who was following him and yeah. found out? Yeah. We immediately heard from the Red Cross what had happened. Oh. Did you see him again? Did you ever see him again? No. He was gone. Oh, that doesn't make sense. So that was the end of my service. You went to the captain and said, I'm done. Yeah. Yeah. I was done. I was unable to go on. 
Jeff and Celia. Wow. <sighs> so then when you okay, so you didn't you described a lot of days. Um, do you do you feel sad in a way that you could never contact them? You could never be in touch with them again? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I would have liked to have seen what had happened to but that was part of the confidentiality that I swore oh, to. Okay. Okay. So I could never do that again. So when they when they came to you, did they mostly come from Korea? Yes. Okay. They were flown in from Korea. But I find it interesting you didn't have any papers or names of them. No. That all went directly to Washington first and then came back to us. Okay. Two, three days later, we would find out who they were. Okay. Rank and everything. Would they, if when you first had contact with them, when they first came to the hospital, did would they tell you their name? Would they no. offer anything? No. Or you were instructed not to do that? No, most of them just you were told to vegetables. Oh. They did not react to anything. Okay. And had they had an incident in Korea? that triggered their having to come to you? We don't know. You don't know? No. Nothing like that? No. We just knew that the minds had shut down. Okay. So our job was just to find a way to open that mind again. Did the families come and visit them at the hospital, or were no. they not allowed to? No. Not okay. at all. So their first contact with their family is if they were sent home on a leave? When they were ready. Wow. And did anyone accompany them when they went home? Um, that I honestly don't know. Okay. You were never asked to do that. That was all the Red Cross. You, ne you were never when asked we, to do that. When we said that they were ready to go home for a weekend, then the Red Cross took care of that. Okay. And it sounds like you were, e even, though, even though you were a corporal, it sounds like that your opinion was respected and you had a lot of support from this Captain yeah. Pierce. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Do you still keep in touch with him? No. No? No. I, I heard from him twice and then I don't know where he went. Okay. Yeah. He and, was a and, neat guy because he really cared. Yes. And... Uh, that was the thing that was lacking with the rest of the staff there. Mm -hmm. So were the, the nurses and orderlies, were they pretty much supportive too? Yes. Were able to work with they them? were terrific. That's good. Yeah. That's good. And they were army? Yeah, they, they were, were all army. As well. mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Wow. But the, it was a good bunch of people. Good. Yeah. Did you ever go back and see them? Or? No. No? No. You just needed to come home? I wanted to get out of there and get home. Yeah. Okay. I can understand yeah. after what happened to you, too. Yeah. Wow. Um, yeah, I couldn't be an officer because um, even though I had doctor status, because I was not a citizen. Okay. I was uh, called to active duty two days before I was supposed to be sworn in as a citizen in Hartford. Oh, okay. So I reported to uh, uh, Camp Dix in New Jersey. Yes. Was processed there and then we left by train to Camp Atterbury, Indiana to do our basic training. And I had a train load. Uh, I was in charge of two cars, and they were all from New York City, from Little Italy. Oh my gosh. And <laughs> most of them didn't speak English. Okay. And wow. we were going to Camp Atterbury, and uh, Some of them got train sick, 
and uh, I was given, as usual, the uh, APCs, the all-purpose capsule. Okay. It's an aspirin. And they didn't work. So I went to the dining car and uh, asked whether they had any really fancy bottles. So they found this nice green bottle, very fancy. I put all the ABC pills in there and came back. And I said I had found train sickness pills. So I handed out the same pills. <laughs> Not one of them got strange sick the rest of the way. <laughs> You're very clever. <laughs> and then when we got off the train, somebody had reported me for giving out prescription medication <gasps> without authorization. So there were two MPs waiting for me and I got arrested. So I showed the bottle to the colonel they are with the MPs. We had a heck of a good laugh. <laughs> so you would trick them into it. <laughs> did, did you ever tell them that that's what you would be? Did you ever tell the guys no. that that's what you would do? No. Okay. Good for you. I'm always thinking. So did they, how did, did they get through boot camp okay, not speaking the language? Um, we had quite a bit of trouble with the uh, officer in charge of us. Oh, okay. Because he insisted that before the meal we had to recite the army regulations, whatever they were called, okay. in English. And most of those guys couldn't do that. And uh, they had to learn it, and it was very hard to have them do it where you could understand what they were saying. Yes. And so he withheld the meals, and you cannot do that. No, you can't do that. So um, I warned him first, and then I reported him. Mm -hmm and made sure that the guys got their meals. Mm -hmm. So, he was not very happy with me. No, I'm sure. Did you have, did you have, did he take action against you in some cases? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But you, you spoke up because of the compassion. I mean, that's just no reason. I know boot camp is supposed to be tough, supposed yes. to be, but that's just inhuman. That's inhuman. You and know. especially because boot camp is so physical, too. Right. You know, you need all yeah. that. You but cannot withhold food and drink right. from the guys when they go through that. And, and a part of the training you could understand would be to learn English and be able to communicate. Yeah. But mm -hmm. Give them time to do that. Right. Jeez. <laughs> So none of none of those none of those kids that were at boot camp with you went with you to your assignment. No. no. Okay. Okay. Um, so when you were corporal after boot camp, is that when you received your corporal? No, I was corporal before. Before. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, now I just I just want to go back a little bit to your headaches because um, I really would like to bring in a little bit of your story from Holland. Um, well, did, in the meantime, did you become a citizen after you got out of the army? Yeah. Okay, that's how Finally, that's when that happened. Okay. I think it was six months after okay. that I finally became a citizen. And were these were some were many of these boys that were with you from um, from Italy and New York? Were they were they not citizens either? Did you find out? Most of them were citizens. Most of them were citizens. But. The, they were brought up in Little Italy there. Yes. And they didn't learn the language. No. Okay. It was amazing. Yes, it you is. Know. It's fine to keep, to keep that culture and language, but when you come to the country, you need to be able yeah. to communicate. Right. But they did, did you have the impression they did sign up 
Or were they drafted? No, they were all drafted. They were all drafted. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Well, hopefully they survived. Yeah, I hope so. Now, was this before the Korean War or during the Korean during War? During the Korean During the Korean War. Yeah. Okay. So before Vietnam. Yeah. Okay. Relatively. Okay. Oof. So these um, these headaches you think were triggered from your memory of Holland and yes. what you saw with the Germans. Yeah. Okay. Could you speak a little bit about that? Do you feel comfortable? Well, for instance, one of the first things when the Nazis came in. Um, and somebody cut the wires to their headquarters. Um, they picked up uh, five people at random, five men at random, and brought them to the center of the city to make them an example of what happened if you did something to harm the Germans. Then he took us out of school and made us watch. Well, they shot these people one at a time at about 10 minute intervals. Oh. And if you shut your eyes, they put you in the first row so you could watch. So, you know, you learn to hate. I was nine years old at that time, and um, I've seen an awful lot of cruelty mm -hmm. that they did. We, in 1943, when the trains started coming through from Amsterdam with the cattle cars, full of Jews and we knew that they were going to Germany and it couldn't be good. We had no idea where they were going. Um, sometimes we got um, uh, told that a train had left Amsterdam and then some of our underground people would uh, put, uh, switch the tracks and put the train on a side track. And then as the Germans would go to the main station to find out why they were on the side track, whether there was a priority train going through or whatever, um, we would take crowbars and open the doors and let as many out as we possibly could get out, um, give them our bicycles, tell them to get out of town as fast as could be. And then, um, as you were taking people out of those cars, every so often there would be a person that was already dead. But they were packed in so tight standing there that Nobody noticed, and we would put them to the side and then uh, rescue as many as we could. Then, when the Germans saw what we were doing, of course, they would close up the whole city. And um, it was interesting to see my mother walking with a strange gentleman and bring them home, and then... As if he was a relative of his Yes. Mm -hmm. Wow. And then we would hide him uh, under her studio, and at uh, night uh, sneak him into either our house or the house that uh, were next door. Uh, the two houses had a central war, uh, wall. Okay. There were two townhouses, uh, two stories, and then an attic. And, you know, um, 
we couldn't let the kids see what we were doing. Your younger brother and sister. Yes, right. because you never knew what they were, might talk about. Mm -hmm. So um, we had a way of transferring back and forth between the two uh, addicts. I see. So that during the raids, um, we could switch them back and forth. The Germans were very, very organized. So when they came to raid the house, they would march up and they would blow their whistles and they would come through our house and search the whole house looking for either Jews or for people, uh, men between the ages of 16 and 60 to send to Germany to work in the factories and release Germans to go into the army. Or they would look for items that they could uh, melt down for bullets. They, anything valuable, they would try to take. And by the end of the war, any coats, blankets, whatever they could do to keep the troops warm, um, they would steal. And then they'd go out, they would form their uh, group again, blow their whistles, march next door, and then they would search that house. By then, everybody in the attic was moved. <laughs> Did you also have to hide some of those items that they were looking for as well? Oh, yeah. Yeah. We had um, a stairway that went to the attic. And you had the attic floor here. And mom's uh, and dad's closet ended up here. So there was this space in between, and we had mattresses in there. And uh, my older brother and my father could hide in there. Oh, so they we, were with you the whole time? Yeah. Okay. So um, we took all the tongues off the tongue and groove boards, mm -hmm. so we could lift those boards up quickly. They could go in all the valuables, uh, the uh, blankets, the, the coats, all went in there. And then they would, we would close them up. But you would have to do it with your mother because she tried not to involve the younger yeah. children. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But they must have been frightened when the Germans came through. Oh, yes. Yeah. You just said, try and keep them calm. Try and keep them calm. That they were yeah. safe and okay with you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. So they never found your dad or your older brother or the no. Jews? Good. <laughs> Good. Or our Jews. It's something you could say. Yeah. And this was in Amsterdam? No, this was in Hilversum. Okay. This was a city basically of commuters to Amsterdam. I see. Uh, it was a city of probably about 120,000 people. And we lived on the outskirts, okay. which was lucky because um, by the end, the latter part of the war, uh, we didn't have any oil for the oil heat. We had switched to coal and the coal had run out. So, uh, and we didn't have any electricity after 1943. Um, so to try and have some heat or be able to cook, mm -hmm. we needed wood. Mm -hmm. And the only woods that were left were outside the city. Yes. And uh, it was a forest that was um, 
a natural camouflage for the main ammunition dump for the Nazis. Oh. So in order to get there, we had to climb down an anti-tank wall and go through a minefield. Oh my gosh. And we had a cart. Uh, while the Germans were laying the minefield, we would uh, sit there with graph paper oh. and put down where the mines were. And we had seven different ways that we could make through the minefield. Oh my gosh. Um, but we knew that we couldn't drag a tree behind us, so we designed a cart. Okay. So we could stack pieces of wood in there and take that to, through the minefield. And we had to get the Nazis used to us having a cart. I because, see. Because, you know, they would ask what we were doing with that. So we became little gentlemen. Hmm. And we would go in the morning and collect the books for the girls, put them on the cart, and take them to school for them. And then after school, we would bring them all back. And those Nazi guards just laughed their heads off. <laughs> they probably thought you were stupid. Yes. Or just not doing yeah. it. Yeah. But they never asked what we did with the card afterwards. And that's when we would oh go. Oh my gosh. So would you have to ha carry the card over the wall? To yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And lower it. And then we would get going. Yeah. We would have three cutters and two stackers. And then we had two kids uh, with submachine guns sitting in the trees. And if a German patrol came upon us, we shot first. Wow. Because if we were caught, yeah. we and our families would all be shot. Mm -hmm. And we knew very well that we couldn't withstand torture. Right. And we would have given up the Jews. Right. Everything. So. And you were kids. You were preteens. I killed my first Germans when I was 13. We were a group of seven kids. One was older. Um, but six of us were all 12 or 13 when we started. And we had decided we would do what we could to keep everybody on our block alive. Yeah. You were part of the resistance that we heard Not about. really. Yeah, not organized. Yeah, not but you organized, just, no. You just did what you had to do to yeah. survive. Yeah. Very clever, wow. And the older one was a Down syndrome. Yeah. And um, he was the son of our fruit and vegetable man. And again, a Down syndrome was an imperfect being. Yes. And therefore, uh, pray for the Nazis. Right. So we always had him with us. Oh. And whenever there were any Nazi raids, we would hide him with the uh, custodians at the high school okay. in the basement. Oh. And they took care of him. Wow. So he made us through the war. Wow. Wow. Yeah. And he, he probably liked being with you when you were... He was great. Yeah. He was just a yeah. great guy yeah. and strong as an ox. Uh, our sauce weren't very good because there wasn't much steel anymore when they made these saws. Okay. So if you hit the knot in the wood, uh, the whole saw would just crumple. And he was the only one who could just absolutely straighten it out again. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. Are you in touch with any of these people? Uh, I was in touch with uh, a few of them, uh, Harry, my closest friend, 
uh, died of cancer uh, 12 years ago. And uh, the twins, uh, they uh, went to uh, Australia and I lost touch with them. But did the others in your group and many people that you knew stay in Holland? Oh, yeah, most of them. Yeah. Okay. So you were pretty much the only ones who emigrated? Yeah. Mm -hmm. did, was there a reason your parents wanted to come here? Um, my father had a customer. He was a tobacco broker. Oh, I see. And the customer was uh, Beuk Cigars, the makers of Phillies. Okay. And Phillies was the biggest selling cigar at that time. And that uh, was sent by the Dutch government after the war to buy the essentials to try and get food and things back to Holland. So he was working for the government and went to the United States, went to Canada, and on one of his trips went to Bayouk Cigars and asked whether, you know, they wanted him to remain their broker. And uh, they said yes, but only if you open an office in New York. Okay. So, Dad opened an office for uh, the company he was working for in Holland, in uh, New York. And Bayouk Cigars was the official sponsor for our family to come to the United States. Amazing. Wow. Was it difficult for you to leave Holland? Um, it was a little bit difficult to leave. Um, we didn't have many good memories. Right, no, no. Um, and it was difficult to come to the United States because we didn't know any English. I see. You know, all the English books were burned during the war. Mm -hmm. Any books about the United States uh, were burned. Um, so we didn't really know anything about the United States. Um, the only book I had of the United States was a book called Tecumseh, which was all about an Indian chief. An Indian chief yeah. And the biggest disappointment was arriving in New York and seeing all these cars and skyscrapers and everything else, another single Indian or cowboy. <laughs> Terrible. <laughs> You have to go back pretty far for that. <laughs> yeah. And then I had to go back to high school. I had graduated high school in Holland. In Holland. Um, I had skipped six, seventh, and eighth grade and did that by exam. I see. So when we got to New Jersey, uh, we went through all the tests. And I needed 17 credits to graduate from an American high school. Mm -hmm. And I took all the tests and I had 32 credits. But I didn't have English or American history. I see. So I had to go back two years. Um, they didn't know too much about uh, how to handle people to get English as a second language. Oh, at that time. So my class was Shakespeare. Oh my goodness. And as far as I was concerned, <laughs> that guy didn't know no. any English no, either. No, no. That's a terrible way to teach it. <laughs> was, there, was there anyone in the community who spoke your language to help you learn English? No. No, you had to figure it out yourself. What about yes. the test that you say that you had to have so many credits? Was, was the test in English or Dutch? Um, well, it was easy. Uh, 
The French test was in French. Oh, okay. The uh, German test was in German. Okay. I was fluent in both languages. Okay. Um, algebra. I uh, had eight years of algebra. I had three years of trigonometry. I had calculus. Uh, so I could go through all these okay. different things so easily. And math doesn't belong to a language, math. Is right. Yours. Mm -hmm. Okay. Wonderful. Yeah. So, yeah, fun. I knew I was in trouble with the Shakespeare. Oh my gosh. So, what a terrible decision. <laughs> I found out that the uh, teacher um, was the advisor to the school newspaper. She absolutely hated that every year she had to go back to the school board and get some more money to keep the paper going. And so I became the business manager for the school newspaper. Nobody in Tenafly or Bergenfield or uh, that whole Bloomfield uh, would turn down this skinny kid <laughs> with his broken English when he asked him to advertise. Oh. So we had to go from a four-page to an eight-page <laughs> newspaper just to accommodate all the ads. Wow. We bought all new typewriters, an addressograph machine, and we turned over $800 in profits to the school. Oh. And I passed Shakespeare. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, that's, that's a good thing to have these days, actually. <laughs> you see Jeopardy as some of those shows. Um, okay, so let's just go back to, to your service. So you, you went to your captain after, that, after what happened to the gentleman from Chicago, and were you able to um, re retire from the, the Army, or did he assign you papers? How did that work? Because you had an honorable discharge. I absolutely cracked up. Okay. okay. And it was total burnout. Okay. And the captain immediately um, recommended discharge and that I go home. And uh, I was discharged the, the next day. And separated, went home. Okay. Were you able to, to get any help at home because of what happened, or you just, just felt that you needed, had to get away from the situation? I needed rest. Okay. You know, you cannot <laughs> keep going uh, with 16 hour days, seven days a week in this kind of a stress mode mm -hmm. and uh, not get burned out sure. and this one incident just Finish. was the trigger okay. that was the end okay. so did, did I you couldn't be useful anymore yeah or to yourself or anybody else mm -hmm. yeah um did you stay in touch with your family when you were down there could you contact them or was it yeah. so much? Every so often I could call them. Oh, you could call them, okay. Yeah. Okay. No, I really didn't have time to write or anything. Right, it sounds like you didn't. And you didn't really need any supplies. It was more the support from the staff, Yeah. from what you said. Um, did you, um, so there wasn't much entertainment either. It was, it was... You couldn't attend it, and there no. wasn't available for them. Did you, as you say, you read the books to them? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, and was there, did you ever play any music with them too, or try that? No. Or was that not? No. Not a good idea, probably. No. Just talking, reading books. And, uh, wow. And you did talk about that one um, USO show? Yeah. Was that scheduled to be on the, on the um, post anyway? Yes. Okay. You know, this was part of the general hospital. Okay. 
so the march board was on one section and then you have a huge general hospital and on weekends there were always uso shows okay did you ever participate in any of them no (laughs) (laughs) that was not something you like to do um did you ever go on leave when you were working or was it pretty much 24 7. um okay i'm sure there probably weren't any humorous events you pretty much got that um and then I asked you about your the officers and fellow servicemen, but it was mostly that mostly one captain. Just, I basically worked with Captain Pierce, and whenever I was in trouble, I would be called to the general's office. And Did Captain Pierce would back you up, though? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that was important to have you. And the general was a really great guy because he knew that I had broken every rule in the book (laughs) but he'd also seen the results yes and he had to warn me you know he had to go through protocol yeah absolutely okay so so we both understood it so you probably became in a way friends with him and yeah. Didn't mm-hmm. feel uncomfortable if you were called to his no. office. Except maybe the first time. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so you um, you went back home to New Jersey? No, went back home. Oh, to Hartford. Hartford. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, were you married then? No. Okay. So what was the homecoming like? Did you Was your family there? You went back to them? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, I promptly stayed there in New Jersey for a little bit and then came back to Hartford. Okay. And um, I didn't go back to the job I had before. Um, I joined my dad in his business and opened an office in Connecticut in Hartford. Okay, good. because I saw that we could have a future with Connecticut tobacco uh, oh. exporting to Europe. Yes. So that was fun. Good. And then I moved to Avon uh, in 1954 when I got married to Mary. ran the business out of my house. Good. Did you ever have to travel back to Europe? For uh, I went back probably about 30 times. Oh, okay. Because we were part of a Dutch company. I see. So Dad and I would have to go back to the headquarters two or three times a year. Okay. Did you ever take your family with you? And uh, no, no. Um, let's see, I took Mary a couple of times and um, then after Mary died and I got married to Kathy, um, we took the boys back with us on our 25th anniversary and showed them where we were during the war and we even found some of our friends. Oh, did you? Oh, yeah. That must be wonderful for you and the boys. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Incredible. In fact, the fellow that, uh, whose family was right next door to us during the war, the last couple of years, our only light um, was a car battery that they had and dad had a friend at the hospital um, where the German army was quartered mm-hmm. who charged all the batteries for the uh, German army and therefore we could stop, stick in this battery 
So between the two houses, we each had two car bulbs. Okay. One in the kitchen, one in the living room. And that was the only light we had. And um, so we were always all together in the living room at night mm -hmm. with the one bulb. That's where we did our homework, everything. Because you, you wanted life to be normal again. Yeah. So he was still there when you went back with the boys? Uh, the yeah. Oh. Um, he had taken over his father's business and had an office in Amsterdam, about two blocks from the hotel oh, wow. uh, where we were staying. And I went over the first day and he wasn't in, but his three kids were. Oh. And they were just a couple of years older than our two kids. The kids hit it off immediately. <laughs> and uh, so he came over as soon as he heard, came on his bicycle. And uh, he still lived in Hilversum. So he commuting. And um, then we went to Hilversum and stayed there for a week. They took us out uh, on a boat on the lakes there and through the canals. We had a lot of fun. Did you tell Kathy and your boys about some of the memories that you went to yes. mm -hmm. in the canals and everything? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. We even went to the town where my mother was born. That town was incorporated in 1830, uh, no, in 832. Oh my gosh. <laughs> oh my gosh. That's yeah. what's wonderful about Europe is the history. It's yes. so many years. Wow. Yeah. You yeah. know, like when I met uh, our friend, he said, let's go uh, to a pub as soon as business is over, you know. Mm -hmm. And before I go home, on the train, we'll meet at the pub. The pub is right behind the new church. The new church is 500 years old. Oh my gosh, <laughs> the new church? That's the new church. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's, a, that's wonderful that you were able to do that. Yeah, yeah. So we had a great time. Good. Yeah. Um, did you ever, um, did you, was your education supported by the GI Bill, or do you feel you had enough of an education in? I stopped uh, after high school. Okay. I did go to college. Okay. Um, it was so hard to try and learn to be a kid again. I just couldn't do it. Okay. And uh, so I decided I wanted to go to work. Good. Okay, I understand that. I've heard that from other people. Um, so what? So you talked about your career afterwards. You went into business with your father. Mm -hmm. um, okay, here's a loaded question. How did your military experience influence your thinking about war or the military in general? <laughs> oh. Well, you had two experiences, World War II and... Yes. I really don't want there to be any wars. Mm -hmm. um, I'll support the military always, mm -hmm. uh, but I really hope we can learn how to live in peace. Mm -hmm. I support it. Did you join any veteran in admitted organizations? No. Okay. Um, so you didn't go to any reunions. To you, the reunions was going back to Holland. Yes. And seeing your friends. Um, how did your service and experience affect your life? <coughs> huh. Well, you strike, let, let me just say, because I know you, you strike me as a very caring, compassionate man of faith. And knowing your background, it, it must have 
been challenging for you because I'm sure you were raised as a wonderful boy and had a wonderful family. Yeah. Um, the things that you had to do in the service, both well before the service in Holland as a child to survive, and the things that you saw, but then also the way that you helped the people, the veterans. Yeah, you know, I really um, am glad I was able to be of service during the war and help people. Um, I really don't want to fight. I don't want to have a gun in the house. Mm -hmm. um, but if anybody threatened our family, um, they better watch out because Yes, I will protect um, you know I've seen so many terrible things that are done um, the last eight weeks of the war in Holland um, we had rations of three potatoes and a half a loaf of bread per week per person. And that was for the people that had ration cards. So since we had made up the false story that my dad and my older brother were in Germany, oh, right. uh, we didn't have ration cards for them. Of course, we didn't have ration cards for the four, four Jews. So we had five ration cards and we had 11 people to feed on three potatoes and a half a loaf of bread a week per five people. Um, we were lucky that we stole a lot of stuff from the Germans. But in the inner city, that was much harder. Um, the last eight weeks, we had five priests in our uh, church. And each priest was assigned an older auto boy. I was an altar boy for Baba Snura. We started every single day with each team doing a minimum of 10 funerals. So in those last eight weeks of the war, we buried as many people in our parish as died here in 9-11. In eight weeks. In eight weeks. And most of the people had starved to death. Yes. You could look and you knew who you were burying next week. And, uh, you know, for an occupation army to let this go on and keep on stealing every bit of food that there was, it's unbelievable. Did you have to take your ration cards to them, to a German officer or a Nazi officer to get your food? No, you went to the store. You could go to a store? Yeah. But were the Germans there to monitor it? No, but, you know, they had to um, account oh, by the coupon. All... Okay that they had given out, you know, you went to the baker and you gave your bread coupon and you got a half a loaf of bread. Okay. Or in our case, with the five coupons, you got two and a half loaves. Wow. And since he was just about out of flour and didn't get very much flour, uh, the bread was 20% flour and 80% ground. To the bulbs. 
you think of Holland and the tulips, but you probably have a different memory than <laughs> most people do or are impressive. No, I love the cook with the tulips. <laughs> you love the tulips? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And did you know did you know about the drops of food? Did you hear rumors no. about it? Or it was a total surprise. That was a total surprise. Wow. I heard about it when I came to the United States. Oh, okay. Only a few years ago was the first time I ever heard about that. Oh, I see. So you weren't in you weren't near the city where the drops were right. made. Oh, okay. You didn't have the benefit of that. No. Okay. Wow. I'll tell you one more story of the war. Um Near the end, the Germans kept raiding our houses and every two or three days they were in there. So we knew we were all probably on borrowed time. We didn't have enough to eat. We got raided. The Nazis knew they were losing, so they were meaner and meaner. Mm -hmm. So we decided that we would celebrate Passover for our Jewish friends. Couldn't find a rabbi anywhere in that whole city. Uh -huh. uh, Father Snuren knew Hebrew, was perfectly comfortable with the Passover service. So he became the rabbi. I stole all the ingredients for the Seder service uh, from the Germans at the hospital. I got everything, herbs and spices and things. Could get, get go to lamb, but everything else I got brought the ingredients. That the uh, Jews made their unleavened bread. And we celebrated Passover in the attic. Forty-two Jewish gentlemen standing there with their hats on. You got them into your home? Uh, it was down the All block. The other, oh, okay. Down the block we had a you were able to transfer a them. large attic. Wow. And the lady of the house was very sick, so the Nazis wouldn't question Father Snurren coming to visit uh -huh. a sick person at night after curfew. Wow. He was allowed. So we celebrated the Passover in there. After that service, looked into their eyes and they were so at peace with God mm -hmm. that nothing could have hurt them. It was the most beautiful gift a priest and a 14-year-old boy could have given them. It's a beautiful ceremony. I remember going yes. to a Passover service when I was in college, living with my grandmother. She was in a Jewish neighborhood and going to it. And how wonderful that you did that for them. It was great. Those are the rewards that are, you know, yeah. most important. Yeah. I think. Yeah. And you, so you continue you continue to work with hospice patients now or in hospitals for volunteer? Well <laughs> um, this is my forty fourth year with uh, the visiting nurse and uh, it's my 38 years president and we have a full hospice service. Um, I'm also a Eucharistic minister so yes. I bring communion to patients at mm -hmm. times and I have a neighbor that I bring communion to every Sunday. Hmm. Um, Where is the visiting nurses that you're associated with? 
In Winstead. In Winstead. Yeah. Okay. Foothills visiting artists. So you serve pretty much the Winstead and part of this Northwest? We now serve, uh, we have patients in 26 different towns. Wow. Okay. We now have 100 employees. Wow. And do you have volunteers too? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because I volunteer with Salisbury visiting nurses. Wow. Uh -huh. My impression is that they pretty much have the northwest corner, Salisbury, Lake Volcano. We uh, also service Canaan, okay. and uh, we are the backup for uh, your village. Yes. Yeah. Um, we're in Goshen, Litchfield, Torrington. Toronto is our second largest yes. area. Uh, Thomaston, Harvington, Burlington, Canton, uh, New Hartford, uh, Heartland, Colebrook, Norfolk. Yeah, we've got a lot of territory yes. that we're in. Hospitals and homes. Yeah. Do you ever do you ever encounter veterans? Yeah. Is that difficult for you, or do you do you? No, work? not at all. Okay, good. Yeah. Anything else you want to add to your story? I think you have I think pretty you have, well. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing, Ted. I can't tell you what this has done. It's amazing. Thank you so much for your service as well. <laughs>